Hello everyone! After a few months of waiting, I finally reached the front of the library holds list for Transcendent Kingdom, Ya Jessie's second novel and her follow-up to her debut novel Homegoing, which I really enjoyed. And I was really pleased with this book, because since I liked Homegoing, I had high expectations for this one. But since it's only her second novel, I did have a bit of this luckily unfounded but lingering worry of like what if she's a one-hit wonder and Homegoing was all she had. So I'm pleased to say that after reading this book, this is simply not a concern for me any longer. Now with a book as anticipated as this one and that came out several months ago, I'm hardly the first to review it, and this morning I enjoyed watching a whole bunch of other reviews about this book, plus a video interview with the author herself that I'll refer to a few times in this review. I've linked below my favorite of these other reviews so you can check them out if you're interested in a different perspective on this book. Now, as I often do, I went into this book knowing pretty much nothing about it, and I really liked it that way, just being surprised every minute. Which is why I'm going to say right now that there will be some mild spoilers in this review. To be crystal clear in what I mean about that, though, this isn't a super spoilable book, and it's more about the narrator's journey to where, or more importantly, who she is today. In fact, if you've read the jacket cover of the book, you'll already know a few key things about the characters in this book that the writing doesn't actually reveal until a little bit later. But if you want to go in totally blind and discover it totally from the writing alone, I recommend you stop this video right here and go and check it out and come back and watch the rest of my review once you've finished. As with many of the books I enjoy, this one isn't super plot driven, but there is a story. It's one involving multiple little story threads that we're learning about as we go. The narrator, Gifty, is presently a sixth year PhD student working to finish up her neuroscience research in a lab in Stanford, California but that's only one of the life challenges she's facing. Her mother is also suffering from a pretty severe bout of major depressive disorder and recently has come out to California to live with her, and she's trying to figure out how to make this all work while still finishing up her research. But this all forms just a part of the overall story. Interspersed throughout the novel, we gradually learn about Gifty's life story, at least as she sees it, from her earliest childhood memories growing up in Huntsville, Alabama, with her Ghanaian parents and her brother, attending a Pentecostal church every Sunday, and then following her as she goes through a whole handful of new experiences and environments leading up to the present day, where she's, I think, maybe 28 or 29 years old, late 20s. These reminiscences aren't told in strict chronological order, but they are told in an order and in a context that always makes sense, and that feels very much like someone reminiscing on her childhood and how she came to be the person she is today. More than any single driving narrative, it's specific scenes from this book that stand out, and this also makes me think I could even go back and read this book again someday to catch the little things that I missed out on this time through. This book does deal with a lot of serious themes, which is probably part of why I liked it a lot. We get solid portrayals of mental illness, including both major depressive disorder and drug addiction, both of which are painted as complex illnesses that we're really only beginning to fully understand these days, and that have historically carried a lot of stigma and still do carry some, particularly drug addiction. Then another central theme, perhaps the central theme of the novel, is humanity's search for comfort and for answers in both religion and science, and how ultimately both have something to offer, but each also has its limitations. This theme was tackled excellently in a way that is neither dismissive nor entirely uncritical of religion and science, and those of us who find our comfort in either or both of these. There are also some instances where we see a dealing with racism, although this novel isn't really about racism in the sense that homegoing was. This is a book about a black person, about black people in mostly white societies, that mentions racial conflicts, but just in a way that is complementary to a larger and different story. Which I really appreciated because, as I noticed in my reading reflection at the end of 2020, a lot of my books by black authors last year ended up being heavily focused on racism, and even if that is an ever-present part of black folks' lives in the U.S., it's also far from being the only part, so it was good to see some of the other experiences of a black person in this novel. In spite of the heavy subject matter, Jessie is a clear and concise writer, and she opts for simple language in a way that I felt was true in her novel Homegoing as well. So for me, her writing really flows in a way that made this a fast read. The book is made up of about 50 mini chapters. That may sound daunting, but they're really short, and it probably only took me about five minutes on average to read each one if I was focused. And I'm not particularly a fast reader, but I did actually read this one physically instead of listening to an audiobook, as I often do. I found that the pacing of everything and the short, interesting chapters gave me this uh, just one more chapter and then I'll take a break mentality. So I ended up completing over half the book in just a few hours of reading one afternoon. 
In Transcendent Kingdom, we gradually get to know Gifty's family and their stories through her reflections in a way that really adds to who she is and has been shaped by them, although many of them have interesting stories in their own rights. But here I think Jesse does a great job of keeping us within the narrator's own mind and body throughout the book. For those who have read Homegoing, a story in which Jesse has the liberty of taking us into another character's mind every chapter, in here we notably don't get that. In fact, that restriction even becomes an idea that is explored in this book at one point. Gifty muses that she'd give anything to see into the mind of a certain other character, but she just can't because this experiential understanding is one of those things that even science just can't help us with. Now, Gifty's character is done really nicely, and although I loved Homegoing for what it was, anyone who felt that they didn't get enough depth on the characters in Homegoing due to the short glimpses that we see of each character's life won't have to worry about that in this novel. In fact, we learn a ton about Gifty, or at least about how she sees herself. She seems very self-conscious or introspective, although maybe not the most self-aware in a sense of really understanding her emotions. This is one of the ways that I relate to her the most, and probably makes sense since I too am a sixth year biology PhD student and see a lot of myself in her character. Now, of course, she is a totally different person than me in many other ways and has tons of different experiences, but I still found her fundamentally believable and relatable. I'm curious what other readers will think of her, though, because I personally and viscerally understand her tendency towards introspection and thinking of everything analytically, and to be totally honest, also her occasional aloofness and tendency to just close off emotionally to others, or even in a way that sometimes prevents her from fully understanding herself and her own reactions. But I also realize that this is probably a kind of a weird thing, um, a characteristic of a super analytical scientific person who feels more comfortable in the world of equations and journal articles than in a world full of messy feelings. So if you're not this type of person, does it make Gifty hard to understand and maybe even hard to relate to? Let me know what you think, because I'm super curious about this. Another interesting comparison we can make, though, is between Gifty and the author herself. Jesse, like Gifty, was raised in Huntsville, Alabama by Ghanaian parents, attended a Pentecostal church growing up, and eventually attended Stanford University, leaving me to wonder at first as I read this book how often Gifty's reflections may encompass some of the author's own experiences and feelings. At times it felt like Gifty's character could be, I'm not sure if semi-autobiographical is the right word, maybe more like pseudo-autobiographical? Other reviews I watched expressed similar feelings, and some did say that it felt almost like reading Gifty's memoir. I wasn't sure at first how I felt about this, but in the end it didn't bother me much because, well, Gifty is a character who's slow to jump to conclusions and leaves a lot of questions open, meaning she can speculate about things and we can assume that Jesse has wondered about the same questions, but then Gifty's conclusions, if she ultimately draws any, may or may not fall in the same place as the author's own conclusions. There are still some obvious differences between Jesse and Gifty, one of them being that Jesse is first and foremost a writer, while Gifty pursues a career in science. The way Jesse portrays a scientist's mind not being one herself was for me really solid and almost had me confused a few times about how she pulled it off as well as she did. Gifty is someone who still feels, well, actual feelings, but also has trouble processing them at times. Now, I don't mean to stereotype scientists or overgeneralize this. Jessie's great strength here is that she portrays a scientist who's anything but an unthinking and unfeeling robot, no matter how she might seem to others when she's in a more aloof sort of moment. But just to say that many of us scientists have certain strengths and ways of thinking that we're most comfortable with, and for me at least, communicating my feelings is not my natural forte. Now, I later learned in the acknowledgments and from watching this video interview with the author that Jesse had a friend who was also from Huntsville, Alabama, who did go to Stanford and do her PhD research there, and this book was actually based on her friend's actual PhD thesis, and on Jesse's experiences shadowing that friend for a while in her lab. Still, I have to give Jesse kudos for managing to capture not just the surface level things going on in her friend's life, but some of the deeper emotional and intellectual experiences of pursuing a PhD. This way of thinking also comes across in how the character Gifty muses about papers she's read, experiments she's heard of, and how they fit together in the sort of puzzle of her mind with her own experiences of her family and her own growth. You might think that if you're not a hardcore science person, why would I want to read all this technical stuff? But it's not really technical. These passages are super interesting and accessible, and referring to understandable psychological and neuroscience experiments, though not so well known that if you are a science person you'll have heard of every single one of them before, which is great, as I picked up some science tidbits myself. And some of this research that Gifty is working on is really recent and cutting edge, since Gifty in this book is essentially doing 
Yajesi's friend's current research. But so far, I haven't really touched on another area where this book really shines, a topic that's already evident from the title and the cover. Gifty grew up attending a Pentecostal church, and in the years since, we learn that she has had her faith tested, and she no longer really attends church, though she hasn't really cut off all ties with her childhood faith either. Jessie develops this idea well beyond a sort of background idea and makes it the very heart of this novel. Gifty, as she turns towards science for answers, initially has this certain embarrassment in being seen as the Jesus freak, yet she comes to realize that her Pentecostal upbringing has shaped her in ways that she has a hard time letting go of if she would even want to at all. I could talk about this theme for quite a while, but I can't really do it justice in a short time. This is one of those themes that is very personal to Gifty, and will hopefully also be so to the reader, and really it's best experienced by just reading this book and seeing the impressions that these individual scenes make on you. As a side note though, for anyone who's apprehensive about reading a novel with clear religious themes, this novel isn't trying to make you think a certain way. It's not trying to evangelize you, nor is it trying to make you abandon your religion. It just covers a lot of topics and challenges that many of us will have thought about whether we were raised religious and are still super pious, or we're no longer religious, or even if we have only explored ideas of religion much later in our lives. And this is actually huge, because there are a lot of books I've read that are kind of challenging to religious and religious people. That's not even the right word, because this book definitely challenges Christianity and religion in general, but in what feels to me like a productive and respectful way, taking an equally critical view of the tendency to just throw anyone who attends church into this mental bucket of the wacko Jesus lover. I mean, I've read some books that I just wouldn't recommend to highly religious people, but also just to most people, because they feel critical of religious folks in a way that approaches outright rudeness and doesn't demonstrate to me any serious thought or understanding of why so many people do find value in religion. And luckily, this is not one of those books. I like how it also kind of critically looks at science, not in the sense of saying that we shouldn't trust science or that it's invalid, but in more of a fundamental sense in that those of us who can't find adequate answers in religion might turn to science for answers, or vice versa. But science is equally unequipped to really and provably answer some of the most basic questions of why things are the way they are. I'm really curious, though, to hear how the discussions of faith in this book felt for anyone who did not grow up in a religious upbringing, or grew up in a different Christian denomination than a Pentecostal church, or another religion than Christianity, as well as for anyone who simply always has been non-religious, or at least wasn't raised religious. For me, though, coming from a Roman Catholic upbringing, there was a lot of food for thought. One example of this was this scene where Gifty's friend Anne in college criticizes her for always following the rules. She says, you never drink, you never smoke, you never do drugs, you never have sex, and you don't even skip class. Now, let's be fair, I know plenty of Christians, both pious and unpious, who drink, for example, and the same goes with skipping class. Yet I can see how a simple decision, like whether it's okay to skip a single class, which realistically is probably not inherently a moral decision in most cases, is something that could be harder for someone raised Christian like Gifty because we're used to framing life in terms of easy to follow rules in which there must be some right way of doing things. And this behavior makes sense. It makes things simpler. It keeps us from thinking too hard about too many unnecessary questions like, am I going to get up this morning or am I just going to sleep through my biology lecture? But we might also tend to follow some of our rules and assumptions single-mindedly and without any second thought as it suggested that the narrator is doing in college. Changing gears, I also found in this novel a mature and nuanced view of mental health challenges that acknowledges the struggles and explores what it's like to go through them or to have a loved one go through them. I say this having been through at least one of these challenges myself, specifically some of what was in hindsight pretty serious depression, as well as seeing a few close friends go through mental challenges of their own. But I also think that this book gets a bit at how we don't have to be clinically diagnosed with a mental illness to be facing mental struggles. There are plenty of mental challenges that we might be tempted to play off as no big deal, but that really do affect us and our well-being, and are an important part of our life experience. Tying this in with the scientific ideas of this book, these challenges can be super frustrating because they are harder to name precisely, harder to understand why we feel a certain way, and involve a lot less certainty than, say, learning we have a cancerous tumor, which is at least better understood biologically. And I found it super interesting that for all the thinking she does about her brother and her mother and other people's mental illnesses, 
Gifty actually is pretty awful at her own mental self-care and seems not even fully aware that her own mental challenges are still just as real as those of her family members, even if not so serious or all-encompassing. In fact, I suspect that this may have been an intentional decision by the author. In Jessie's interview, which I've linked, she says that in writing Gifty, she saw herself writing an unreliable narrator. Not because Gifty is clearly lying to the readers or because we have any reason to doubt the truth of her objective statements about the world, but because Gifty doesn't really understand herself emotionally, despite her frequent attempts to psychoanalyze herself and to discourage others from doing so. There's also the way in which this novel covers drug addiction, a topic with which I'm lucky enough not to have had the same first-hand experiences, but that can be utterly devastating, and this book really dives deep into the challenges it involves for addicts and for their loved ones. Jesse's decision to make Nana's addiction an opioid addiction is kind of genius, which I only realized afterwards when watching the author interview in which she addresses this topic in much more detail than I will here. As is touched on in the book, a lot of black people addicted to drugs have it brushed off as a personal failing or a bad decision, but due to the way that opioid addiction has affected a lot of white people too, and has been covered more sympathetically by the media, it's easier for us to peg Nana as a more sympathetic character, even as a victim, when we learned he started using drugs when he got hooked on painkillers. Like, I hate to say it, but just thinking about how I perceived Nana's story myself, when I first heard the narrator say, my brother died from a heroin overdose, my reaction was, man, that's horrible. He must have fallen in with some bad influences while he was out partying or something. Whereas then when it's revealed a bit later that it stemmed from an Oxycontin prescription for a basketball injury, suddenly things clicked in a different way. And well, even though I already did see him as a victim, it just suddenly fit more cleanly into this narrative of him being nothing more than a victim, of this being a kind of disease. In summary, there are a lot of interesting and deep themes covered in this book, and this book is one that will make you think. Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Jesse is an excellent follow-up to her 2016 debut, and I highly recommend it for you if you found any part of this description appealing. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Ya Jesse has for us next, although I imagine it'll be a little while, because I think she's definitely proven herself again as someone who has a wide range of writing ability. So give it a read, let me know what you thought, and until next time, Bye, and happy reading.